Back in the 70s, when the world was new, Gary Gygax felt like he would know if the game was developing properly if each table ended up with its own unique set of house rules. That was healthy, he thought. Later on, when other companies were trying to make money selling supplements to his game, he got real frisky about using the official rules, but that was later. He didn't see what the DM does as being wildly different from what he did when he wrote the rules. I said the same thing. When you decide to get behind the screen, you're going to end up developing your own ideas about game design. And also, I think, story structure, drama, theme, pacing, characterization. DMs and writers have a lot in common. Just like DMs and game designers. So, I don't know how that sounds to you. Each table having its own unique interpretation of the rules that they develop through a combination of trial and error, discussion, and consensus. It's not, I like these rules, but we like these rules. They're ours. But I sort of think that is inevitable. Every table is unique, and how the game is played from one table to another can vary wildly. And I wonder if people realize that. When I see folks arguing about class features and game balance online, it seems like they think everyone arguing is playing the same game. But I don't think they are. There's this perception among very online dungeon masters that the rules represent this objective reality and there is no room for interpretation and house rules are somehow degenerate. These are the same folks who get really into stuff like damage per round and optimized builds that go all the way to 20th level. These folks see D&D as something that can be solved or even something that is intended to be solved. Like that's the purpose of it, like a puzzle or a video game that you can speed run through. And I think this attitude alienates a lot of DMs who feel like, does this actually make sense? Can you speed run D&D? Can you reduce an entire class down to probability and numbers? Well, I'm a game designer and I know you absolutely can compare one class to another and see how they each dip into the action economy, how or if they get bonus actions, reactions. Do they have resources to manage? How does a class with a resource that can run out sit in a group with another class that can just do its thing every round and never runs out of anything? But that's just normal game design. The problem I see in these online discussions and why I think they are mostly smoke and mirrors is the game is played differently at every table in a way that is not true of like Rocket League or a board game. And these differences create huge variation in everything. How many players you got? Huge variation. Some tables it's a DM and two players or even only one player. Some tables have six or seven. This creates massive differences in things like encounter design, rewards, adventure design. Your perception of how long combat takes is hugely affected by the number of people at the table. You can have two people arguing about how long combat takes and they think they're arguing about the rules of D&D because they see those rules as principally responsible for this. When in fact, the main factor that is causing them to argue is, one DM has a couple of players, thinks combat is fun. The other has a whole bunch of players, thinks combat takes forever. And I don't think it's linear. I think adding one more person to the group means everything takes much longer because it's not just another two minutes for the new player to take their turn. It's all of the discussion and debate about what to do, which for a lot of players is the fun of the game, problem solving together. Have you ever had to tweak an encounter because the design assumed there were more or fewer players than you have? If there's exactly four players, then this adventure is sort of balanced. But if you only have one or two or six or seven, you need to monkey with the number of monsters in there and it's not immediately obvious how to do that. You think adding three goblins to this encounter will balance it out for your party, but it turns out now the battle is a lethal challenge for your players because those three goblins made all the goblins more effective. You can't really take an adventure design for one player and drop it into a function generator, turn the dial to four players, and hope to get an optimized adventure for your group. There are too many variables. That's what I mean when I say encounter design does not stop just because you rolled initiative. You're gonna keep tweaking hit points and maybe even AC while the combat is going because of the difference between the intended design and what's actually happening at the table. Whoever wrote this adventure, didn't know how many players I have or their style of play. You know your player's style. Wizards of the Coast doesn't. Neither does MCDM. We can't design a single adventure that is optimal for every style of play. It's impossible. 
I've experienced this directly, and if you've watched only a few online games, you have too. One table is full of tabletop gaming nerds who play Robo Rally and Dune together. Another is full of folks who hang out and watch movies together or play social games. Even if both groups have the same number of players, these differences in style mean an adventure that works really well for this table needs a lot of work to make it fun for that table. I have played with folks where just adding this one specific player to your table, because they're an experienced wargamer, suddenly mean all the bad guys need to be a lot tougher. Doesn't matter what class he's playing. How on earth would the rules account for that? Oh, if you have a really good tactical player, add this monster to your encounter and it will all balance out. You know, a table with a lot of tactical players will grind through an orc encounter very differently than a bunch of social gamers. And the reverse is true. One group might think that infiltrating the Baron's gala in disguise and discreetly whispering into the guest's ears trying to plant suspicion of who murdered his wife sounds like a lot of fun. Another group might look at that encounter and just throw up their hands, hope the DM lets them just make a persuasion check and move on or whatever. Huge variation in the number of players and style from one table to another, and not only is no adventure equally suited for every table, I don't even think every class is balanced the same for every possible combination of players and style. There are some tables out there that think this class is hugely overpowered, and others who think it's sort of weak sauce even though they're both using the same design. Different tables have wildly different reactions to the same design. And no one talks about this. I'm, I'm, some people do. But mostly everyone online just assumes that they all basically have the same table playing in the same style. And the only thing to argue about, therefore, is the rules. But I think the differences in tables and style of play is the most important thing to talk about, way more important than the actual rules. Tabletop RPGs are not like other games, but there are a lot of folks online who only seem to have fun if they can assume that they are like other games and they can just take all their arguments about which boss is overpowered in Elden Ring and just import them to D&D. Can't be done. This is one of those videos where I'm just expressing how I see things and I don't really have a solution. But I wonder if you couldn't come up with something like an alignment chart for groups. On one axis, how big is my group? I don't know what the categories would be, but maybe one to two players, three or four players, five or more. Maybe not, because I think having only one player is a unique challenge. Then you would have another axis, which is how tactically oriented is my group. On one side, we're basically war gamers, which does not preclude also liking the social roleplay stuff. And on the other side, we're basically drama geeks which does not preclude also liking the tactical stuff. I'm reminded of this chart on the back of all the classic Avalon Hill bookcase games where they showed you how complex the game was and also how suitable it was for solitaire play. This was back when, if you were a board gaming nerd, you were very likely the only board gaming nerd you knew IRL, and IRL was the only way to know people. So suitability for solo play was a major selling point. You know, it used to be back in the Usenet days where folks had signatures to their messages that folks who played a given game would have a code in their signature. I remember for the Legend of the Five Rings card game, it was just this string of numbers, but it represented how well you knew the rules, uh, how often you played. Did you play 1v1 or multiplayer? What clan did you play? Did you play in tournaments? Had you ever won a tournament? And you'd end up in an argument with somebody about something and then you would check their SIG and you would see, oh, this person only plays 1v1. They have never experienced any of the problems my group are having with this stupid game because there's eight of us. It was very useful when it came to understanding where the person on the other side of the screen was coming from. Imagine an ecology where there are lots of different adventures out there and they are, I don't know, color coded so that you know a light blue colored adventure is for small groups of socially oriented players. A deep red adventure is for big groups of tactically minded players. And then you get a whole rainbow of adventures supporting different flavors of table. Or like these charts on the back of the Avalon Hill games. One bar is group size. Another one is social versus tactical. Maybe we would get more and better adventures this way since designers could start from, oh, I want to make an adventure for a small group of socially minded players because we would have language for this stuff. And you'd have a much more robust discussion online because we would have tools to help communicate about how we are playing the game. Anyway, just something on my mind I thought I would share with you. It might make a difference in how we talk about the game. Probably not, but it's still worth a video, I thought. We are still prepping and planning our next big project, the MCDM Monster Book. If you want an alert when it goes live, we have a link you can click down below. 
The Beast Heart Minis are back in stock, so if you want a pet owlbear or a pet sporling, hi thee hence to mcdmstore.com. And if you don't know how a pet owlbear works or what a sporling is, you could pick up the Beast Heart, our new companion class for 5th edition. Thanks for watching, folks. We got a lot of different kinds of videos in the pike, so I don't know what you're going to see next. Something cool, probably. Until next time, peace out.